Now, uh, I know you're all just meeting today, and you've done a great job so far. I'm going to remind you one more time to play nice. It can be hard to find community in a new place. Everyone has their own little clique. All the lunch tables are all taken up at lunch, and you just get used to people butchering your last name. Until now, hopefully. Please welcome to the stage Monterey Park's own Oscar Sagastume. Um, I grew up in Monterey Park. I went to Repetto Elementary and then Mark Keppel High, and I never fit in because I look like that. <laughs> I mean, come on, All right, take it off. But man, did I try. I did try, and I, I, when I was a child, came up with the brilliant idea to join the hall monitors to make friends. <laughs> it sucked. Because I was a militant hall monitor, <laughs> and I was the Genghis Khan of the hallways. <laughs> when my older sister saw how terrible and desperate I was, she told me that when I joined her in high school, I should follow her lead, and so I did. She had me join the band, the theater department, and La Raza. This was an organization that celebrated Latin culture, and I knew my parents would want me to be part of this because they really wanted me to get in touch with my Guatemalan background. A little backstory. My family moved to Los Angeles from Guatemala when I was two years old, and when I was five, my mother noticed something. When she would call out to me, I wouldn't respond. And then when she would talk to me, my eyes would glaze over and my parents feared the worst. They took me to a hearing specialist and he ran a bunch of tests on me. After the tests were done, he called my parents into his office. And I remember he sat behind this really big black desk. He took off his glasses and he cleaned them. He said, I know why you're having issues with your son. And I looked over and I saw my parents grab each other's hands, bracing for the news. He took a deep breath and he said, uh, he doesn't understand Spanish? <laughs> yeah, he only speaks English, so you're gonna, you need to speak English to him. You see, my parents wanted me to be an American and speak good. I mean well, I mean well. And when we moved here, my sister, when she started going to school, uh, she was placed in an ESL class. And my folks had to take an English class, actually, at Mark Heppel High. And I remember going with them when I was a kid, and the teacher would be go, going over American idioms while I was playing on the floor with my toys. And my parents didn't want me to suffer through those classes, so they pushed me to be American and speak English. We didn't have any money for your fancy tutors, so they plopped me down in front of America's tutors, Big Bird and Mr. Rogers. <laughs> and I acclimated, and a little too well for their liking. They wanted me to act Hispanic, but I was American. Like many immigrants, my parents moved to a city to be close to other Hispanic people, and in the early 80s, Monterey Park was mostly Hispanic, and as I grew up here, trying to fit in, the city shifted from a Hispanic populace to an Asian populace, and my parents' idea of cultural comfort in this city disappeared. The city didn't know who it was, which made going to a school that was also powering through growing pains very challenging. Having a mixed ethnic population was difficult for the teachers to handle. I had one teacher, though, that would lament that the school was much better off with white children, like God intended. <clears throat> and she would tell us, in class, <laughs> repeatedly. But that casual racism didn't bother me, but the air of a racial... <laughs> it didn't. But the air of a racial divide makes it hard to make friends. 
not a lot of kids had much in common with each other. Sure, we all watched the same cartoons and TV shows, but really TV was our only shared experience. Heck, we wouldn't even say the same thing when someone sneezed. So I was stuck in this weird sort of limbo. I wasn't like any of the other kids. I wasn't Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. I mean, obviously. And other kids, other like Hispanic kids would call me a coconut because I was brown on the outside and white in the middle. I, I wasn't Hispanic enough to them. And I wasn't like the normal kids. I mean, I loved Borscht Belt comedy. And I, I also got way too many references when I watched the Golden Girls. <laughs> and I watched the Golden Girls. I mean, I, I couldn't wait to, I couldn't wait for high school. I mean, things would have to be better, right? <laughs> Which leads me back to the group La Raza. We met during lunch and we would eat together. And I hadn't really sat with anyone during lunch for years. Normally I opted to eat alone in the library because I hated how lonely it felt to eat at a table built to hold eight people. As much as I didn't fit in with the La Raza kids, I stayed because being alone was harder. I wasn't really even bullied in, school. I was bullied in school, I was just invisible. And La Raza was happy to have me because of the color of my skin. As long as you were brown, you were welcome. When I was a sophomore, two things happened. One, my friend uh, in La Raza got a girlfriend of Chinese descent, and this guy named Raul joined the group. When my buddy got his girlfriend, he start, she started coming to the meetings and offered to take notes and help out. She would sit in the back next to my friend, happy to be near him, and Raul, Raul did not like this. He didn't think it was right. Raul thought that the group was only for brown people, so he called a secret meeting. Raul wanted to kick out my friend's girlfriend. To my surprise, a bunch of other people agreed, and it made me angry. I didn't see what the big deal. She wasn't doing anything. She was just there. She was part of the club. She was just hanging out with her boyfriend. And she was nice, and she came out to support us. Raul wouldn't listen to reason, so I left the group in a huff, vowing never to return. But because my sister was still part of the group and my parents wanted me to return to La Raza's loving embrace, <laughs> I had to go to this stupid fundraising dinner. And at this dinner, with all these people that decided not to stand up to Raul's crazy divide, um, and they were all there enjoying a meal that my buddy's girlfriend had helped set up, <laughs> trying to get it kicked out, it just made me mad. I mean, if I was old enough to drink, I would, have, I would have been drinking, but I wasn't. So instead, I just stared at Raul, trying to decide what I was going to say to him, what I was going to do. And then at one point toward the end of the night, Raul came to talk to me. And in English, he told me how sorry he was that I left and that La Raza would always welcome me back. Then he turned to some other member and in Spanish started to tell her that I was a traitor to Hispanics <laughs> and that he was only making nice because of my sister. But deep down, I would always be a fat coconut. He laughed, but stopped when he saw the look on my face. Because even though I couldn't speak Spanish, my parents had made sure that I understood it. <laughs> and Raul did not know this until then. When he tried to backtrack in English, I raised my hand and I told him to stop. And I told him that I understood what he said. And then I said, um, well, things. I said things. A language I cannot repeat because this might end up on the radio someday. But they were bad words. Lots of bad words. And I wasn't eloquent. I was just angry. And then I left in a huff. But I didn't drive. So I just walked out to the parking lots. <laughs> and waited by my parents' car. <laughs> at Baker Square. At night. La Raza was the first place that had welcomed me blindly, and it was a group of people that looked like me and accepted me. It hurt to be separated, but I felt betrayed, and I couldn't be part of a group that only cared about what I looked like on the outside instead of who I was on the inside. Thank you.